the first American physicist, Benjamin Franklin, did a bunch of experiments with, uh, well, he's famous for an experiment with lightning and such, but he did a bunch of experiments rubbing fur on amber and glass, and he would rub things together and find that they had different forces of attraction. We can simulate one of those experiments with two pieces of tape. Notice these pieces of tape are in identical situations. They're both stuck to the table. Now, I passionately will rip them off. Get ready. Check this out. And now, they are not at all attracted to each other. Check these out. They, uh, they really don't want to be near each other. You see that they are bending away from each other. But if instead I put one piece of tape down on the table and put the other piece of tape down on top of it like that and then take them off the table and separate them. Now see, <clears throat> they're not in exactly the same situation. I got the sticky side of this one over here and the sticky side of this one is facing that way also. So it's sticky side of one stuck to the non-sticky side of the other. And if I rip them apart now, let me get some contrast here for you, then they will, whoa! And they're actually very attracted to each other because now they have opposite chart. Hey, hey, easy now. Yeah, see that? I mean, that's Wow, so electrostatics is pretty cool, and eventually it was discovered that there are just two types of electric charge, and one is positive and the other is negative, and assuming you're not destroying the uh, subcomponents of atoms, you're not gonna be getting down to the quark level, all you can get is a multiple of this fundamental charge, which is 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. So check this out, a coulomb, wow, one coulomb is an enormous unit. It probably involves something like 10 to the 19th charges altogether. And if you, uh, <clears throat> if you find that the structure of an atom, a certain, oh, oh, I hope you'll believe me, that uh, inside of an atom there are some protons and there are some neutrons, maybe I'll do you a helium right here, and then there's this enormous amount of empty space, and this is way not to scale, but somewhere out here, there's an electron, and you don't quite know where it is, and there's probably another electron somewhere over here, and you don't quite know where it is, and that's some physics we'll get to later. But these electrons are creating the volume of the atom, and they're almost never in any particular spot. In fact, if I were to define a particular spot, I would say they are never actually at a particular spot. And they're sort of everywhere at once and nowhere at the same time, and it's a big mess. But the electrons are like the sentries guarding the atom from any other atoms coming by towards it. So you've got negative charges and you've got positive charges, and you can explain why the electrons want to hang out, right? They want to be near these protons. But why do the protons, whoa, that nucleus is tiny. Why do the protons want to be so close to the other protons? And this is explained by the strong nuclear force keeps those suckers together. And there are a few ways to charge things. Typically, if you get some random thing like, I don't know, a potato or a juice box or something, you get a juice box and uh, you set that sucker down. Let's see, I'll set it down so it won't leak. You get a juice box and you set that sucker down. It's got the exact same number of protons as it does electrons, which means that it is neutral. And if I wanted to charge this jukes box, first of all, I'd have to get it away from other things that are conducting electricity towards it and away from it, etc. And I could charge it by friction, let's say. So I could take, um, <clears throat> never mind the juke box metaphor, let's uh, ju <laughs> juice box. <laughs> let's say I take a cat, and the cat's like, meow, over here. And it's got a tail and a head probably too. And it's got some fur on it. <clears throat> and if I take a, uh, a glass, cylinder, and I rub that glass cylinder on the cat, I don't know if you'd need to kill it first, you could probably just hold it down and rub the glass cylinder on it. Then the cool thing about fur is fur, ooh, fur doesn't really hold on to its electrons very well. Fur loses electrons, and the thing about the electrons is they can't destroy, they can't stop existing. So um, those those electrons jump over. Well, let's get another color here. Those electrons right here. Let's say these are all electrons. The electrons jump over to the glass rod. I'll label this sucker as a glass rod. 
And the glass rod then is negative. So we have charged by friction. And it's also called triboelectric charging if you want to be formal. Triboelectric charging. This, um, this is a really wonderful thing because it's not very well understood why certain substances have exactly the electro affinity that they do. Why glass prefers to grab electrons and fur prefers to loses it. <laughs> prefer, yeah, of course it does prefer, right? It's fur. Uh, there's another way of charging things. You could charge things by, in my lab, I've got these things called electroscopes. And they look like this. And this is a metal ring. And this is a base. And it's, uh, it's not conducting. So there's an insulator here. I guess insulators uh, don't allow electrons to move within them. And metal, in general, all conductors and all metals ought to be conductors as a condition of them being a metal. Uh, the metal allows the electron to move freely. So it's got like a conduction band where it just lets the electrons go. It's like, uh, it's like that lane where if you have a high occupancy vehicle, you can get into that high occupancy vehicle lane and you can go really fast. But if you, um, dang, I guess if you're in rush hour and there is no high occupancy vehicle lane, then you're stuck in an insulator and you cannot travel if you're the electrons. So there's also this thing up at the top here and this is not, ooh, I'm gonna have to draw this carefully. Let's say all my insulators are gonna be orange. There's a little orange insulator right here also. And then there's this thing that comes down. It's also metal. First of all, there's a top plate and the top plate's like that, and this is connected through the insulator. So it's not connected to the metal ring, but it is there with the metal ring. And then there's this thing that looks like that, and then connected to it, there's a needle. And this is what I like to call an electroscope. Let's do that in red. From the root electro, probably related to electron, and scope meaning to see, like microscope and telescope. So this allows you to see electrons, kinda. So what I can do is I can take a glass rod that has been charged negatively and I can touch it to the electroscope. And the one thing you need to know about charges is positive charges don't like each other and negative charges don't like each other either. But those positives, they'll like the negatives and the negatives like the positives. And the thing is, the electrons are free to move but the protons aren't. Why can't the protons move? They're stuck in here with the strong nuclear force but these electrons, these guys are free agents, sometimes. In a conductor, the electrons can jump, just jump off. In an insulator, if you give the electrons a path where they can jump, they can also jump off. So notice that a glass rod is actually an insulator and fur is actually an insulator, but with the triboelectric charging, you can scrape electrons off of one substance and dump them on the other. Now they can't move, they're stuck right where they land on the glass rod. And they're attracted to it and they're happy being there. But if I rub the glass rod on the top of the electroscope, then I can charge the electroscope. So let's say I give it a whole bunch of extra electrons. Those electrons are like, Bee! and then the electrons don't like each other, right? And they see a path for them to spread out. Now they can't go to the metal ring. So they go down here and they're like, Wee! all spreading out. But then they also see a place to connect here. This is just metal. And so they go on there and they go on there. And the cool thing is this needle is not usually like that. It's usually upright because gravitationally that's where it prefers to be. But if, and it's a very subtle preference, it just barely prefers to be there. But if you've got a bunch of electrons here and a bunch of electrons there, then there's a force this direction. There's a force this direction and a force that direction. Force when net charge is present right here. And that causes you to be able to see how much net charge is present. Now a similar thing might happen if you got, uh, ooh, ooh, this is gonna be a little bit different. Should I draw a picture? Nah, I don't need to draw a picture. You can look this up on other websites. Um, if I bring something that's negatively charged over, I get this pattern right here. But if I bring over something that's positively charged, like the fur, for instance, which has just lost a bunch of electrons, then I could put it on a neutral electroscope. Neutral means no net charge. And I could rub it on the top right here, and the electrons in the electroscope would then jump up into the fur. And that would cause the fur to become closer to neutral, and it would cause the electroscope to become net positive. Because you see, if the electrons that are here 
originally causing it to be neutral, leave, then the electroscope will become positive and it will also show a charge. So you can't tell whether the electroscope is negatively or positively charged just by looking at it. You could do a further experiment and I hope that you'll figure out how to do that by further study of electroscopes, but that's the idea. Electroscope will show positive charge and negative charge the same way in that this needle, which was once upright, will turn a little bit. And what else do I want to say? Oh, okay, this is called charging by, put a little green on here. How did we charge the electroscope? By touching it with something that was charged. Cool. And the final method of charging it also involves an electroscope. So just for ease of drawing, I'm going to check out my previous picture of an electroscope. I've got this and I've got myself a little um, insulating path here. There's a break so that we can get our, the business end of the electroscope going over here. And then this comes down through here and there's a little bit of that business right there. And then the electroscope needle is doing something. So ultimately it starts out, I guess it starts out like this. Electroscope needle starts out like that almost vertical. And then if I manage to charge it by this complicated procedure, you could take a balloon. Right? You can take a balloon and you can rub it in your hair. And if you take a balloon and you rub it in your hair, then you will get a balloon that has a whole bunch of what on it? You guessed it, got a whole bunch of electrons over here and the balloon is therefore very negative. If I bring this balloon over, this is, see charging by, this is called indu induction. Charging by induction is a complicated procedure. You have to do step one, bring, charged object nearby. And so if we bring this balloon nearby, then it will scare the electrons away from the top. This would be like, oh, a lot of electrons. And the electroscope's electrons are like, I don't like that. And so then we get electrons down here. And the electroscope, though it is still net neutral, has a whole bunch of extra electrons down here and a whole bunch of extra protons up here. So we say that it becomes polarized. <clears throat> polarizes, I'll say that this step polarizes the electroscope. I'm just using an electroscope because we can visualize it, but in principle you could charge any conductor by induction. An inductor, an induction, woohoo! And charging by induction requires a conductor. And the second step is, this is very often presented in a way that I think is rather stupid. The second step is while the charged object is nearby, <clears throat> I need to provide a path a conducting path to ground. And that's, okay, so step one is we bring that guy over, and step two is we provide a conducting path to ground. So I'm actually going to hook a wire onto here or touch this thing and draw the international ground symbol right there and say that this is Step two, we have provided a path to ground. Now these electrons that don't like each other were all scared down because of the presence of this negative balloon up here. So the electrons then see a path that they can run away and ground is sort of like an infinite temperature reservoir. It's an infinite charge reservoir. It's happy to accept your extra electrons or give you extra electrons as you see fit. The ground is going to take care of everything and it's not gonna change its charge. So we have these electrons, we running down here and um, <clears throat> then I'll say, Mm. In this case, uh, I guess I have to be general, but I will say electrons either leave or enter electroscope. So now the electroscope is still polarized, but it's also got a net charge. And then step three, step three is, well, I guess in step three, there are kind of two things that you're doing. Yeah, we could break it into three, into four steps. Um, step three, uh, remove ground. And so if I touched the bottom of this, then I stop touching it. And so I will say step three, <sighs> cut the wire.
Okay, and when you remove the ground, you're trapping these, well, you've got, ooh, you had a neutral electroscope that was polarized and you caused electrons to leave, so now the electroscope doesn't have as many electrons as it needs, so the electroscope is positive. And then once you've removed the ground, then you can feel free, haha, <laughs> that's not step three again, it's step four, to remove the charged object. This was the original thing, and we had to be holding it nearby the entire time. So we're going to bring our balloon back away, and dot, 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 dot. The result is charging by induction. Charging by induction means that electroscope will be opposite charge of original object. And this is always the result of charging by induction. That's it.